start this by showing you this, uh, this sculpture here by this guy, Shigeo Fukuda. This is a sculpture made of knives and forks. And it looks like a pile of junk of, made of knives and forks until you shine light through it. And then you see this amazing motorcycle. And there's other, he, he makes others. So what, what this reminds us of is that there are hidden patterns and things that are not apparent until you look at them in the appropriate way. And what I want to do now is, uh, in, this, in this short talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a, a, a brief tour of some of the amazing capabilities of living systems, some, some remarkable things that living bodies do. And we're going to talk about embryogenesis and regeneration and, and plasticity. And then what I'll do is uh, I'll close off with some fundamental gaps in the field, because I think knowing what the, what the questions are that are still open is as important as, as knowing what we already know. And I'm going to give you a quick teaser for the talk uh, downstairs, where I'll actually get into what we've done in this space to figure out how some of this remarkable stuff works. So let's talk first about embryonic development. So all of you uh, started life as a single cell, the fertilized egg. And remarkably, this process uh, led to the self-assembly of these incredibly complex forms. So whether an elephant or an oak tree or a jellyfish or whatever it is, every egg re uh, reliably develops into one of these co highly complex uh, uh, anatomies. And uh, note that it's not enough to simply have stem cells that produce the right tissues, because what you see down here is a teratoma. This is a tumor that might have mature tissues. It might have skin and teeth and bone and muscle. But what makes it different from the embryo is that it's missing the large-scale three-dimensional organization. So the question is, where does pattern come from? We all start life as a single cell. Where does this? Here you're seeing the cross-section of a human torso. Look at the complexity. Look at how all the tissues and organs are in exactly the right place relative to each other. Where does that information come from? And people will generally tell you two things. They will say the genome, okay? But of course, the genome encodes proteins. The genome doesn't directly say anything about shape. And people will say that it's all about cell differentiation. And I'll show you here one example. This thing is an alga called acetabularia. This whole thing right here with a really complex little cap and a root and a stalk here, that's one cell. The whole thing is one cell. So there's no question of cellular differentiation and cells becoming different types of cells and so on. So we see right away that, that there are some important things that we need to understand. Um, embryogenesis is reliable, but it's also robust and flexible. So if I take an early mammalian embryo and I cut it in half, I don't get two half embryos, which is what you would get if you cut any human technology in half. You would, in fact, you will get uh, two perfectly normal monozygotic twins, and that's how, that's how we get twins. You can also do the opposite. You can take two early mouse embryos, smush them together like a snowball, and out comes a perfectly normal mouse. Slightly bigger, but perfectly normal. So you see that this process is, is remarkably uh, uh, robust in that it's able to overcome early manipulations that really uh, are, are drastically different than what normally happens in development. Beyond embryonic development, we can think about regeneration. And so this is a process where adult bodies repair themselves. Now here's a time lapse of a salamander. So here's what a leg looks like. This other salamander came along, which they do all the time, and they, and they bit off the leg. And within a few weeks, you get a perfectly normal leg back, indistinguishable from the normal leg. Now, these creatures, this happens to be a Mexican uh, salamander called an axolotl. These guys regenerate their limbs, their jaws, portions of their brain, their ovaries, their eyes, their spinal cords, uh, throughout their lifespan. Okay, so people who study regeneration are really interested to figure out how this works because, of course, we would like to do this as well. Um, I introduce you to another animal. This is a flatworm uh, called planaria. And planarians are the champions of regeneration. These guys regenerate everything. So you can cut one of these worms in pretty much any orientation you can think of. Uh, the record, I believe, is about 273 pieces. Every piece will regenerate exactly what's missing, no more, no less. They regenerate their brain, they regenerate their intestines, their nervous system, everything. And when they've, when they've done, they stop. And this is one of the most remarkable unknowns about regeneration. Not only how do we get it started, but how does it know when to stop? How do, these, how do these cells know when the large-scale structure has been achieved? In fact, these guys are so regenerative, there's no aging. So individual cells will senesce and die, but the animal regenerates them. And so there's no aging on the scale of, of, of the whole animal. This, it's sort of a Zen riddle. I sometimes ask my students, uh, how, how old is the planarian they're looking at? And there's no answer, because these are the actual, these worms in our lab are in direct physical continuity with worms that were here hundreds of millions of years ago. These are the very same animals. Um, they reproduce by cutting themselves in half and then regenerate. So re um, regeneration, of course, is not just for lower animals. Uh, 
the human liver is highly regenerative, and the Greeks knew that, as you can see from this, uh, from this myth. How they knew that is, uh, is anybody's guess, but that's the one organ that uh, actually is fully regenerative. Uh, deer is an interesting example. Every year, deer will shed large amounts of bone, and then next year, they grow back the antlers, sometimes at a rate of over a centimeter per day. Think about that, a centimeter of new long bone per day. And antlers are not like horns, they're, they're actual long bone with, uh, with innervation, vasculature, and skin covering them. So, so this is an adult large mammal uh, that's highly, highly regenerative. And in fact, you may or may not know, human children, usually below the age of 11, are actually able to regenerate their fingertips. So a clean amputation, um, be in the old days they would, uh, they would sew the tip over with skin, and if you do that, it doesn't happen. So basically, you just keep it clean, and if it's above the, the last uh, knuckle on the finger, they'll grow back um, and they regenerate. And then this, this, uh, this ability is lost with, with age. So in addition to simply regenerating, we see that in some animals, this goes further as an example of what's called anatomical surveillance. So here's an experiment. Uh, we take the tail of a salamander, we surgically attach it to where a limb is supposed to go. And what happens over, uh, over some uh, period of months, that tail is remodeled in place into a limb. Now think about what that means. All the cells of that tail, including the cells at the very tip, now need to know that they're supposed to be a different organ. They need to understand their, their identity, not at the cellular level. We're not talking about simply differentiating the cells. They need to make a structure that is more appropriate to the large-scale anatomy of this animal. They're making decisions not about their own identity. They're making decisions about the shape of the whole, uh, the whole organ. And so uh, being able to understand where they're located and what a standard salamander is supposed to look like is something that these, uh, that these cells are able to do. Um, another thing that these processes can do, and so everything I'm showing you is about the control of shape. You see that? Uh, this is also extending to, to a, a problem of cancer. So one way to think about cancer is as cells that have basically, for whatever reason, stopped obeying the normal patterning cues of the body. They've, they've reverted to an almost unicellular uh, um, uh, identity where they treat the rest of the organism as, uh, as, as the environment, and they do whatever they want. And so it turns out that processes of regeneration and development can reprogram or tame cancer cells. So old work in the salamander by uh, cutting off salamander legs that have a tumor on them, or in fact putting uh, aggressive human uh, cancer cells into embryos show that the surrounding environment can provide patterning cues that will cause these cancer cells to behave normally and to become part of normal tissues. And so this potentially has real implications for cancer therapy because uh, killing these cells with, uh, with, uh, with toxins, basically, chemotherapy may not be the only, the only way to go if we understood how, the, how these other systems were um, reprogramming them. And beyond the plasticity of, of, uh, of, of the anatomy, we also can talk about plasticity of function. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really... Um, I'm pleased to be for, for the first time at a, at a conference where I feel like I can, I can show you things and most people are going to go, yeah, that's so what, yeah, that's, that's not so amazing. We've seen, we've seen, you know, we've seen this before, whereas uh, usually people say, that can't, be, that can't possibly be right. Uh, so, so what I'm going to show you, the, f the first thing I'm going to show you is uh, here, here's a tadpole where we decided to ask uh, about the plasticity of the brain. And so what we did was we prevented the primary eyes from forming, but we put an eye on its tail. And downstairs I'll talk about how, how that happens. But basically now you've got a tadpole uh, that has, a, has the only eyes on its tail, and this is a, a frog brain that's evolved for processing visual input from two specific locations in the head for millions of years, and now it's in a totally wrong location. And then we made this machine, which you're looking at down here, we made this machine that can actually test uh, vision in these tadpoles. It basically trains them to behave in certain ways based on light cues. And what we find is that the frog brain has absolutely no trouble uh, seeing out of that eye. It's amazing. It, it can recognize that the, that the information coming from this weird, itchy patch of tissue on its tail is visual data, and plugging that into its normal behavioral programs. So the brain dynamically adjusts its behavioral program to a, to a radically altered body plan. And we have many other examples of this with our six-legged frogs and things like this. Um, I'm going to show you another example of remarkable plasticity. You might ask if the planaria, or in fact any animal, is highly regenerative, what happens to its memories when it regenerates its brain? Now, this is an important biomedical question because within the next couple of decades, you're going to have human patients in their 50s and 60s who are having portions of the brain replaced with, uh, with the descendants of stem cells. And so you might ask yourself, well, what happens to the memories of that individual as, as their brain matter becomes replaced with, with new cells? Well, so um, 
how this guy McConnell back in the 60s discovered the following thing, and, and, and pretty much nobody believed him, but it turns out it's, it's absolutely true. Uh, we've been doing work on this now. If you take these planaria, and, and believe it or not, planaria are smart, so you can train them to do specific things, and then you can uh, assay their memory. So if you train a planarian, you can chop off their heads, the tail sort of sits there and for about a week or 10 days until it regenerates a new brain, and when it regenerates the new brain, it remembers the original information. And so what this is telling you is that information is, at least in this system, not stored entirely in the brain. It's, probably, it's, it's in some way distributed throughout the body. But then it's also imprinted on the new brain as the new brain develops. So um, the internet noticed this and, uh, when, we, when, when we published this and then had many, many questions uh, about this. Um, yeah, there, there are many, uh, many, many difficulties in training a flatworm, but, but you, can, you can do it, uh, it turns out. So what I want to talk about briefly now is, is some fundamental knowledge gaps. Um, the, our, our field is very good at um, identifying mechanisms. So we, we, we like to drill down into the molecular biology, the biophysics, to try and figure out exactly how all this works. But what's really crucial is not only the mechanisms, the molecules that are required for these things to happen, but the algorithms, the information processing. How do the cells know what to do in addition to how do they do it? I'm going to show you two examples that provide a really tough problem. The first problem is called trophic memory in deer. And the deal is that in some species of deer, uh, they make an invariant branch pattern every year. So every year it's the same set of branches. And so you come along at time zero and you take a knife and you etch into the edge of the, of the antler somewhere along the branch pattern. You cut through the velvet, notch a little bit into the bone. The deer do this to themselves all the time anyway. They, they rub against fences and things. And so you make this, you make this incision and that year it heals with a little callus, so it just heals the wound, and that's that, and those, those antlers fall off. You get um, a, a whole other set of antlers next year, and at that point, what you will get is an ectopic tine, or an ectopic branch point, at the location where the damage was last year. And this goes on for three or four years, and then, uh, and then uh, after about five years, it goes away. This, is, uh, this was discovered by a, a guy named Bubenik, and this is really remarkable because if you, for, for, those, for those in our field who are used to making uh, models of molecular pathways, you, you, could, you could go completely crazy trying to come up with a molecular pathway for this because the cells at the base of the scalp really need to remember, A, where the damage was, so they're storing some sort of three-dimensional map of this thing, and then they need to alter the low-level rules by which the cells make local decisions about growth and branching and things like this, so that at some point in the structure, you actually get this ectopic tine. It's, it's really difficult to, to see how this would happen. The other thing uh, I, I, I want to point out, this, this uh, remarkable problem in planaria, that's, uh, if you, the, the way these worms reproduce most of the time is they tear themselves in half. They can do sexual reproduction with sperm and egg, but they generally don't. What they mostly do is they just tear themselves in half. This means that unlike for the rest of us, any mutation that occurs in the body that doesn't kill one of the neoblasts or these special cells gets propagated to the next generation. This is like if you had some sort of a, you know, an event, a mutation event in your arm, and then your children would have the same thing. It doesn't, it doesn't happen with, with almost any other creature because we reproduce through sperm and egg. It's called Weissman's barrier. Only things that happen to the germline get passed on. Planaria aren't like that. They pass on everything. And so over hundreds of millions of years, they, these, these guys have accumulated a tremendous amount of mutation. Their genomes are a mess. Um, the, the cells have even different numbers of chromosomes. They're called mixoploy, these animals, because you can't even count on them having the same number of chromosomes. So their, their genome is a complete mess, and yet they are the best regenerators ever. Each of these planaria, when cut, makes a perfect planarian regenerate each time, every time. Right? So there's this remarkable puzzle of how their genomes can be so screwed up when the pattern is, is, is so correct. And in fact, planaria are the only, to my knowledge, the only model system where there are no patterning mutants. You can get zebrafish and frog and, and you know, of course, uh, fruit fly and nematode. You can get these lines of animals with specific developmental defects because they have genetic mutations. People study those. No such thing in planaria other than uh, something I'm going to show you in a couple minutes. Uh, all you have are, are stock planaria, perfectly normal, even though their genomes are, are really messed up. So the current state of the field is basically this. And, and, and in pointing out these problems, I'm not saying that these are insolvable. I'm just saying we don't have the answer yet, so that, that, that's very important. So what we're very good at is sequencing genomes. It's become very cheap and easy to sequence genomes. What we can't do is if somebody gives you a genome, 
you can't predict what anatomy it's going to be. Now, you can sort of cheat and compare it to other genomes that you already know what they look like, but if you couldn't do that, you, we, we, we do not have the ability to look at a genome and say, uh, is this thing going to be shaped like an oak tree or an octopus, or what is this thing going to look like? We have, we have absolutely no idea how to do that. We can't tell if it's going to be regenerative or if it's going to remodel itself, and we have, generally speaking, no idea what to tweak if we wanted to alter the pattern. So let's say you had a genome for an organism with four fingers and you wanted it to have five fingers, what would you do? Or if you're looking at a birth defect, you would like uh, a, you know, the normal complement of five fingers, what do you need to tweak? So um, for those of us who, who were told that uh, you know, the, 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 the genome projects were going to answer every question, this is, this is far from, from true. They're, they're very important information, but we still need to do the hard work of getting from the genomics to the anatomy. Um, what we really don't understand very well, even though we can model um, the molecular pathways, is how complex structures control the cellular and molecular events towards specific anatomical outcomes. This is top-down control. How cells and networks make decisions and how they keep memories about these global properties. These are all things that we are actively working on. And so just uh, in the last five minutes, I just want to um, go over a couple of quick things which I will talk about in, uh, in, in tremendous detail downstairs at 3.30. And what I'm going to tell people is that uh, all cells, not just nerve and muscle, communicate electrically. There are bioelectrical circuits, natural bioelectrical circuits throughout the body. One of the things these circuits do is they implement a kind of primitive cognition, and what I mean by that is they make decisions. And what I'm going to show is that rewiring these electrical circuits can give some really remarkable applications in the control of growth and form. So I'll show some six-legged frogs and things like this. And the applications are in areas of birth defects, regenerative medicine, and cancer. Um, I, think, I think this also has a lot of uh, implications for understanding evolution and the relationship between the genome and the body. Now, before there were brains, it's really important to think about the fact that cognition and, uh, and, and, and mind and things like this are not uh, uh, new with the invention of brains. Here you see one cell at the uh, upper left. This thing is hunting, it's going around uh, picking up food. That's, that's one cell. And on the right, you see a wasp that is the same size of a paramecium. Those are taken at the same uh, at the same scale. So we see that there's a, there's a, tremendous, uh, um, ver a, a tremendous variety in, in, in both size, uh, both single-cell creatures and multicellular creatures, and all of these have to do complex things to get around. Uh, most of these kinds of uh, creatures have learning ability. Uh, evolution discovered uh, that, that electricity is a really good medium for computation long before multicellular creatures came along. So, so uh, cognition and, and bioelectrics are not just for brains. They were here long before that. And so what we do is hijack these bioelectrics, and here you see our six-legged frog. This is not for, uh, this is one of the five-legged ones. Uh, this is not Photoshop, this is a real animal. They're all alive and well in our lab. And what you're seeing down in the lower right-hand corner is a movie made by my colleague, Danny Adams, which is showing you for the first time the actual electrical conversations that these cells are having with each other. If you're interested in energy fields in the body and, and, and how you know, cells communicate via these kinds of signals, here they are, and we can now literally see them directly. And keep in mind, these are natural, purely electric voltage gradients. There are no, there's no magnetic component, really. There are no applied fields. We don't use any field application um, to modulate these things. So um, in the last two minutes, the take-home message is pattern control is fundamental. If you could control anatomy, you could solve birth defects, traumatic injury through regenerative medicine, uh, cancer, and so on. And tissues, not just brains, compute for really remarkable plasticity of growth and form. And primitive cognition is an ancient, ubiquitous aspect of life that takes advantage both of emergence and top-down control. And so I thank uh, the various people who have uh, contributed to the work uh, that, I was, uh, that I was just showing you. Uh, we always thank the model species that, that work with us on this, the, the tadpoles, planaria, and so on. Um, and I'll just close by showing you uh, uh, what have been called impossible biological objects. So here, here are some two-headed planaria doing their thing. And for more information, uh, 3.30 downstairs. Thank you.